Good evening and welcome to the Centre for Independent Studies. My name is Tom Switzer and I'm the Executive Director here at CIS. It's great to have your company here this evening for the launch of this important new book. Now, can I say from the outset that I'd like to acknowledge here this morning the former Prime Minister, Tony Abbott. Tony's here to launch this book. It's called Dignity and Prosperity, The Future of Liberal Australia. It's published by Connor Court and edited by David Stevens. And what a time to reflect on the Liberal Party. These are dark days for the party of Menzies, Fraser, Howard and Abbott. It's out of power across the mainland and it faces some very serious challenges, including attracting younger voters, uh, winning back professional women and reconciling the conservative and liberal wings of the Liberal Party. So the question tonight is, is the Liberal Party damaged goods? How can it revive its political fortunes? Now, Tony Abbott will make a few remarks before we do a Q&A. Tony, of course, was Prime Minister of Australia from 2013 to 2015. And I think it's worth recalling he won a massive landslide election victory in September of 2013. Um, he picked up 18 seats and won 53.5% of the two-party preferred vote. Now, by way of comparison, and this point gets all too often lost on much of the mainstream media, by way of comparison, his successor, Malcolm Turnbull, lost 14 seats. Turn Turnbull lost 14 seats. Abbott won 18 seats. Abbott won, as I said before, 53.5% of the two-party preferred vote. Turnbull, 50.5%. In 2022, Anthony Albanese picked up eight seats, not 18 seats, and he won 52.1% of the two PP. Now, Tony, of course, was a senior cabinet minister in the government of Prime Minister John Howard, uh, and he was a Liberal MP from 1994 through to 2019. He's been a regular guest at CIS over many years, and it's great to welcome him back. Please welcome the former Prime Minister, Tony Abbott. <laughs> Well, thank you very much indeed, Tom, and thank you everyone for being here. Uh, it's important uh, for our country that we try to analyse uh, what makes a good government, what makes a good and successful political party, and that's exactly what this book does. Uh, I do have to say that as I was reading the draft chapters, I did think that the real title of this book should be how great was the Howard government <laughs> and how bad was everything that's come afterwards. And the truth is that the Howard government was an extremely good government, uh, the best government of recent times. And yet you'll forgive me, I hope, if I do say just a few words in praise of the government that was in office between 2013 and 2022. Now, yes, the Howard government was a wonderful government. Uh, it won four elections and it was a government which changed our country for the better. There were workplace relations changes, there was tax reform, there was welfare reform, but it wasn't perfect. Um, it was the Howard government that introduced the renewable energy target, admittedly at a much, much, much lower level than it subsequently became. It was the Howard government that put in place the ban on civil nuclear power, admittedly, in order to get legislation through the Senate that would enable the nuclear reactor at Lucas Heights, which provides so many important uh, medical treatments, to be uh, upgraded and modernised. It was uh, the Howard government which didn't reform Section 18C, and notwithstanding the fact that it had almost 12 years in which to do so. And it was actually uh, the Howard government that in its last year or so baked in permanent spending on the back of temporary uh, revenue. Nevertheless, um, I say that just because no government is immune to criticism and given that mine and uh, those that came after me have copped so much, I think it's fair enough that we share the blame. Um, look, um, of course the government that was elected in 2013 was a disappointment. Uh, in particular, the revolving door prime ministership, which also means revolving door ministers 
uh, damaged that government in terms of what it could do because to do anything effective, uh, you've got to take charge uh, and it takes even the best of um, ministers some time to get their feet under the desk and to appreciate exactly what needs to be done. Nevertheless, uh, uh, the coalition government of 2013 to 22 is the only Western government which has successfully stopped a major inflow of illegal immigration by boat. Uh, we did actually repeal taxes uh, in a way that didn't just lower them, didn't just adjust them, but abolish them in a way that no other government has. Uh, in Malcolm Turnbull's time, uh, we did lead the world uh, in standing up to the aggressive dictatorship in Beijing. And to Scott Morrison's everlasting credit, uh, the AUKUS agreement is really uh, a strategic watershed. Uh, for the first time in our history, uh, we have set aside strategic caution uh, and resolved to be a country that plays its part uh, in the affairs of the wider world. I think that had the 2014 budget not been sabotaged in the Senate, uh, had the Japanese submarine deal uh, not been derailed by the cargo cult politics of Adelaide, uh, had the Federation and tax reform white paper processes uh, not been stopped by my successor, it would have been a much better government. But nevertheless, uh, there was a lot to its credit uh, which should be praised, not as much as we would have liked, not as much as was achieved by the Howard government, but nevertheless, uh, quite a lot, notwithstanding all of the difficulties. And yet, uh, there are great lessons to be learned from the Howard government, uh, seven of whose ministers feature prominently uh, in this book. I think there are two key lessons to be learned from the Howard government. First, good government depends upon clear thinking and great preparation. And this is where, if I may say so, uh, someone who uh, receives almost no credit uh, and some scorn these days in centre-right circles, uh, my former boss, John Hewson, was responsible for the fight back package, which while politically unsuccessful at the 1993 election, did provide a substantial roadmap, both for the Keating government, uh, unacknowledged, and then somewhat acknowledged uh, for the Howard government uh, over the subsequent 11 years. But the Howard government, uh, more so than any recent coalition government was prepared to fight for the things that it believed in, whether it was uh, Prime Minister Howard and some of his senior ministers fighting uh, for the crown in our constitution against the onslaughts of Paul Keating and his acolytes, whether it was insisting uh, that there was no such thing as something for nothing uh, and people who were capable of work should work either for a wage or for the dole, uh, whether it was um, the early version of stopping the votes, stopping the boats uh, under John Howard uh, and Philip Ruddock, uh, or whether it was John Howard's determination to ensure that we took pride in our history and we actually taught our history, <coughs> this was a government that was prepared to fight. It's common today uh, to suggest that our party is at a low ebb, uh, even to say that maybe our party has finished. But we've been here before. Uh, in 2008, the only, in fact, the senior elected Liberal anywhere in the country was the Lord Mayor of Brisbane. Um, we're actually in a slightly better position now, at least in those terms, uh, than we were uh, back then. And just as our party recovered then, uh, you can be absolutely certain that at some point in time we will recover now. I think that the recovery could come much sooner than people think. Um, as Australian patriots, we have to hope that all governments succeed, including governments that we didn't vote for. Um, 
in all my dealings with Anthony Albanese, he's been a decent human being uh, and I wish him well uh, as an Australian. Uh, but when I look at what's happening, the energy policy disaster, uh, the re-regulation of the economy, uh, the rampant political correctness, I think this will be a target-rich environment uh, in 2024 or 2025 for a Liberal National Coalition that is determined to be a clear and strong alternative. And frankly, uh, I can already see the outlines of what I think would be an election-winning policy. No more coal-fired power stations will be allowed to close uh, until there is a clear and reliable alternative. The anti-nuclear ban uh, will be repealed, not because we will necessarily have nuclear power uh, anytime soon, but because we must have that option. And if we're going to have nuclear reactors tied up at Garden Island, uh, why couldn't we, uh, at a pinch, move some of them uh, 10 yards onshore where they can help to power up our industries and our jobs? Uh, the best policy of the last election was the super for housing policy. Um, I think young people are desperate for a stake in our society. Uh, it's almost impossibly difficult for people on normal wages to save a deposit. We are forced uh, to hand over uh, more and more of our wages to super funds, which can't manage our money nearly as well as we can. So why shouldn't people be able to access their superannuation, indeed take their superannuation uh, for their first home and in opposing the voice, perhaps the most illiberal measure ever put forward by an Australian government in opposing Labor's Canberra voice, I think Peter Dutton has found his voice. And that's exactly what we want uh, from the leader of the Liberal National Alternative Government. Tony um, and David, please join us. This is David... Um David Stevens, who's the editor of this publication. David uh, worked as a senior advisor to Prime Minister John Howard, and uh, he's been a senior tax economist at various uh, accounting companies. Uh, Tony, um, I, I know you, you take a fairly optimistic view about the Liberal Party. These are dark days. I mean, as I mentioned in my introduction, the Liberal Party is out of power all across the mainland, and it suffered a big disappointing loss in the by-election of a very well, what had been a safe Liberal seat in Victoria called Aston. And uh, it's very rare. In fact, I think it's been 100 years since a government has actually won a by-election in a federal uh, context. And um, you have people like Malcolm Turnbull, but he's not alone. He reflects this orthodoxy, if you like, that the centre of political gravity in this country has shifted a bit to the left, especially younger, more progressive voters. Um, and Turnbull's argument is that the Liberal Party today... Uh, represents the right-wing fringe, and to the extent that those trends continue, it can't possibly win a federal election. Your response? Well, Tom, I'd ask you to name what these right-wing policies are. Well, uh, he would argue, I suspect, uh, uh, he would say that the um, many Liberals today are browner than John Howard on climate change, you know, the nuclear issue. He'd say that's a fringe issue. I think he'd say that the Liberal Party in Victoria seems to be, this is Turnbull's argument, transfixed on transgender issues? Well, there's one, there's one member of parliament in Victoria who quite properly and quite courageously stood up for the rights of women to their own spaces. And for some reason, the leader of what was what's supposedly the Liberal Party uh, has, uh, has banished this, this woman, this brave and decent woman. Uh, I think it's completely incomprehensible. Now, Tom, if it's true that the public have moved to the left, uh, um, is that because they've moved to the left uh, or is it because they haven't had the leadership to stay on the right? And my view is that regardless of where the public are, it is the duty of a centre-right political movement to argue for centre-right positions. And sometimes you'll succeed better than in others but your duty is the same in good times and in bad. Uh, you do not surrender to your opponents just because your opponents might currently be winning. But um, 
your critics would say that the Liberal Party lost many erstwhile safe metropolitan seats, uh, obviously your seat in 2019 of Warringah, but also at the 2022 election, the Liberals lost Kuyong, which is Robert Menzies' old seat. Um, they lost Higgins to the Labor Party, uh, Peter Costello's old seat. They lost McKellar, uh, Rowan Bishop's old seat in the Northern Beaches, uh, North Sydney, where I live, uh, Joe Hockey's old seat. They lost that to a teal. And then, of course, uh, Wentworth. And then in Queensland, you had uh, both Brisbane and Ryan, of all places, the crown jewels of the Liberal Party in metropolitan Brisbane, going to the Greens. You've got Curtin in Perth going to the Teals. Um, those voters apparently left the Liberal Party because they said the Liberal Party was too right-wing. Well, I think that they may have left the Liberal Party uh, because they didn't think the Liberal Party had fought hard enough for what a standard Liberal conservative principles, namely greater freedom and smaller government. Uh, don't forget we've just been through the pandemic uh, and all governments, regardless of what their stated uh, position was, uh, spent like drunken sailors and all governments, regardless of their normal stated position, um, connived at the most extraordinary restrictions on freedom in our modern history. So, so uh, I suspect disillusionment with the government was just as much to do with its abandonment, at least temporarily, of what were normally centre-right positions uh, as from its failure, alleged failure, to do enough on climate, uh, social justice, integrity, whatever. That's, that's my view. Now, if I go back to my own seat of Oringa, uh, which was, if you like, the first mm. teal victory back in 2019. Uh, the voters of Warringah are a pretty sophisticated lot and um, they knew that I hadn't changed my views uh, and they'd voted for me despite my supposedly antediluvian view on uh, traditional marriage, uh, despite my supposedly... Uh, 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 climate denying views on on emissions and so on they'd voted for me uh, despite all of those things with greater or lesser enthusiasm I think the problem in Warringah in 2019 was that they were a bit annoyed at the Abbott Turnbull rivalry they'd seen Turnbull quit they knew I wasn't going to quit and they thought that the only way we can put that era behind us is uh, if we vote him out. Um, that's my instinct. And I think the fact that uh, Scott Morrison and his wisdom um, had had made me uh, envoy, Indigenous envoy, which was sort of a cross between an olive branch and a fig leaf, I think that <laughs> made them think that really we're not sure that Abbott has a future in the parliament and maybe we should cast around for someone else. Let me turn to this um, post-election Liberal Party review by uh, Brian Lochnane and Jane Hume, Senator Jane Hume. David, please, you chime in. Don't <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, yeah. I'm, starting, I'm starting to feel a bit picked on, OK? <laughs> you might be, Tony. <laughs> no, let me put this one to you. This is, this, is an, this is a disturbing figure, though. This is the Lochnane Hume post-election Liberal review. The Liberal Party holds only three of the top 30 electorates for professional women three out of 30, compared with 15 previously. Is that a problem for the Liberal Party? Well, it's a problem that we don't have 50% of the seats in the parliament plus one. That's the problem. The question is, how do we get those seats back? Now, I don't think we get those seats back by playing identity politics. I think we get those seats back by being a good, strong alternative. And I am absolutely confident that as soon as a bad Labor government is attacking the financial well-being and the economic security of the uh, hitherto well-to-do people of the teal seats, they're not going to reject... They can't reject a Labor government by voting teal. The only way they can reject a Labor government is by voting Liberal. And when this government gets bad, they'll vote Liberal, as sure as night follows day. Yeah. Um, what about younger people, David? Younger people, as well as professional women, younger people, all the available evidence seems to indicate that uh, 
so-called millennials. So these are people born from the early 80s until the late 90s, the Gen Z, the next generation. Uh, they take um, a benign view of socialism. They're naturally very anxious about the housing affordability crisis. According to all the available polling, they're very concerned about climate change. How do you think the Liberal Party should reach out to both demographics, the younger voters who are becoming more left-wing and the professional women I just mentioned? Okay. Um, perhaps I can also just start by picking up on Tony's point in your previous question. I think we also have to look at the socio-demographic changes that have been happening in some of what w were traditionally safe Liberal seats. Um, but, you know, if you take, and I know Victoria and Queensland better because that's where I, I've lived, if you look at, for instance, Kuyong, Josh Frydenberg's seat, that has the youngest demographic of any seat now in Victoria. Now, that's not what you'd think of when you think of Sir Robert Menzies, you know, family homes, small businesses, retired uh, middle class Australians. The reality is that seat, because of the university being built there, the building of lots of student small housing accommodation, has changed. And anybody who can tell me how is Kuyong or different to Higgins, Peter Costello's old seat, which is where I grew up politically, and that one fell to the Labor Party, one fell to the Teal. So I think we have to look at socio-demographics. Your chapter in the book looks at the Anglosphere, and as you point out, and I think we all know, and Tony knows as well, if you go to London, um, very well-to-do areas of London vote for the Labor Party. They don't vote Tory anymore. It's the home counties that vote Tory. And the red wall seats that voted Tory for Boris Johnson. You go to the US, the richest cities in the United States, from Manhattan to Silicon Valley, are staunchly Democrat. And the poorest areas... Mississippi and Arkansas, Texas, Florida are now increasingly not so poor, but they are the seats that are where the Republicans. So to Tony's point, I think it's, it's there's other factors, particularly economic, that come into play. Uh, on professional women, I think, and I was asked about this the other day um, by a journalist uh, who was interviewing me about the book, um, I think that what Scott Morrison did to Christine Holgate, the CEO of Australia Post, um, had a, sent a terrible message to professional women. And I know many Gen X professional women in places like Sydney and Melbourne in law and finance, and as soon as he treated her like that, they immediately turned against him. Um, and that created a big problem uh, amongst that demographic. And it also sent to younger women as well a message that, oh, if that's how easily you can be dismissed... Um, when you've gone so well to get to such a position of authority, that's a very bad sign. So I think there were many mistakes made. Um, in terms of young people, yes, um, traditionally conservative parties have never done all that well with young people. At the moment, we have an issue about ideas, uh, and I think it's very important, and the book talks about that a lot. Um, unless you promulgate ideas that are positive and optimistic for the future, why would any young person vote for you? Because that's what they're interested in. So to Tony's point, things like housing, things like making it easier to start a small business. You know, I live on the Gold Coast now and I say this is the new heartland of liberalism. Why? There's no big business, there's no big unions, there's no big government, there's no big tech. It's full of small households, young families with children, tradies, influencers, entrepreneurs, retirees, these people who just want to get on with their lives, they want a better life, they don't want it to be expensive, they don't want it to be constantly intruded into. Um, and I think that's a very important message for the regeneration of liberalism is to, is to highlight the importance of freedom and liberty and what that provides you, as the book is headlined, Dignity and Prosperity. If you give people freedom and liberty and opportunity, what do you get? You get a prosperous nation and you get a dignified people because everybody's treated equally and can move forward. Uh, David mentioned the centre-right parties in the United States and Great Britain. So the, the Republican Party in recent times, particularly under the leadership of Donald Trump and the Tories, especially under Boris Johnson in 2019... Um, they won over a lot of the working class constituencies in the American case of the Rust Belt, um, the old Rust Belt states of uh, 
Pennsylvania and uh, Wisconsin, Ohio, uh, and of course in the British case, uh, Northern England and the Midlands. And last year at our CIS Concilium, we hosted a, a distinguished Washington Post columnist named uh, Henry Olson, and his argument was the sweet spot for centre-right parties uh, for, the, for the foreseeable future is to go left on economics for security purposes for those working class folks and right on culture and national identity. Um, your response, Tony? Well, I certainly think that we've got to be the patriotic party. And um, just as Howard said uh, often and rightly that the coalition is economically liberal but socially conservative... Um, I used to say that as Liberals, we believe in lower taxes, smaller government, greater freedom. As Conservatives, we believe in the family, small business and traditions that have stood the test of time. But above all else, as patriots, we think our country is the best in the world and we want to keep it that way by building on our strengths. Now, now you know, we are the Freedom Party, the Tradition Party, we're the Patriot Party. And... I support the free market, but I don't support in exporting our jobs to countries that are our strategic competitors. Uh, I don't support um, failing to do enough for Australian industry that we couldn't make a bullet here if we needed to. And uh, I don't think that means becoming economically left-wing. I think that means being economically sensible. I mean, Thatcher did not set out to deindustrialize Britain. Reagan did not set out to deindustrialize the United States. And if you'd put it to them that free market policies would uh, have that result in the longer term, um, and it was really just free trade with, with China in particular um, that's to some extent at least brought that about, um, they would have said, well, actually, we're going to adjust the policies accordingly, and and uh, so I, so look, I, I I am reluctant to say anything as sweeping as we should be more left wing on economics and more right wing on culture. Um, I think we've got to be humane on everything, humane and sensible on everything, but our instincts have always got to be a preference for freedom, a respect for tradition, and a love of country. Can I just add, yeah. Yeah, to add to that? Because there's a chapter in, that I co-wrote with Hugh Morgan, uh, the very distinguished Australian businessman, and we talk about national prosperity and the drivers and particularly looking at the mining industry. And I think you've highlighted as well, Tony, in your opening remarks, you know, the best way to destroy any capacity to be able to build anything in the country is to move from being the lowest cost, most reliable supplier of energy to within a generation being amongst the highest and most unreliable suppliers of energy. You know, nobody can manufacture anything. And if you look at the situation in Germany today, industry has fled Germany to other countries in the region that, that have, have secure supplies of energy. So the industrial heartland of Germany has lost its technical know-how because of its failed energy policies. So I think that's really important. And the other aspect we talk about is being competitive. We've, we have not focused on competition. And to your point, Tony, you had papers being looked at this. How do we lift our productivity? How do we lift our competitiveness? In, in the year 2000, Australia was ranked third, fourth or fifth by every global indicator of competitiveness and ease of doing business. Today, we barely get into the top 20 globally. Well said, David. And look, could I just, I should, I should have added this. Um, wh whenever, this was a mistake we fell into uh, in the last few years of the um, Turnbull-Morrison government. Um, for all sorts of important reasons, it was necessary for us to stand up to the Beijing government. And for shorthand purposes, we said China when we should have said the Beijing government. Because A, the, the Chinese, Chinese people, government. yeah, or well, the communist government, because A, the Chinese people, like people everywhere, want to do the right thing by and large, and, and, and B, 
uh, there are about a million or so Australians of Chinese background. And the last thing we want to do is make them feel in any way okay. unwelcome now you say, because they're fantastic yeah, no, contributors no, 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 to you our say country. All that and we'll take questions very soon. But you say all that about the, the China policy uh, position of the uh, Turnbull and Morrison governments, but that election review that I mentioned, you know, the Loch Nain Hume review, found that in the top 15 seats by Chinese ancestry, the swing against the Liberal Party, again on a two-party preferred basis, was 6.6%, 6.6% swing compared with the 3.7% in other seats. Now, if, as the Lowy Institute China scholar Richard McGregor, your old schoolmate at Riverview, uh, he warns that the tone of the Turnbull-Morrison-Dutton China policy cost the Liberal Party votes in the fast-growing ethnic Chinese community. Now, if that's true, how did the Liberals win back those ethnic Chinese voters while maintaining a hawkish stand on the communist government in Beijing? Precisely by differentiating between China and the Chinese people on the one hand and the commissars that run the Beijing regime on the other hand. Right. And you're saying that Morrison and Turnbull didn't, and Dutton, for that matter, didn't do a good job doing that? Well, it's, as I said, it's, <clears throat> it's, it's easy in the ebb and flow of debate to uh, use broader brushstrokes than you should. Uh, we all tend to do that sometimes. And unfortunately, it's not your considered remarks, but your off-the-cuff remarks which get you into trouble. I once said to Kerry O'Brien that what he should pay most attention to was the stuff that was carefully considered and scripted as opposed to something that you might blurt out in the heat of the moment, uh, unconsidered or ill-considered, and I was in terrible trouble <laughs> for allegedly saying <laughs> it's okay to tell lies. <laughs> but I thought it was actually a truth that I was trying to express However clumsy, <laughs> however clumsily I'm, I, I, I might have done it. But just on this subject, can I also say the first Chinese-born member of an Australian parliament was a Liberal, Helen Shamho, mm. and the first Chinese-born member of the federal parliament was Senator Bin Shen, also a Liberal. So just like the first Aboriginal member of parliament was a country party guy up in Queensland and then the first federal parliamentarian was, of course, Senator Neville Bonner. So our party has a great record in, it, in when it's, whether it's women, whether it's been Aboriginal people, whether it's been Australians of Chinese background, our party has a great record. We don't always get sufficient credit or indeed any credit for this, but that's the vengefulness of our critics and perhaps our own unwillingness to blow our own trumpet. Well, talking about the critics, is they will say that the Liberal Party divisions over the voice uh, indicates that it's going to be very difficult to reconcile the conservative wing of the party with the smaller Liberal wing of the party. David. Well, I, I, look, I know there are some Liberals who, who favour the voice uh, and that's just the reality that there will be people who... Cause the nature of the Liberal Party is that we are a very broad church. Uh, and sometimes the church is very broad and it stretches out the door uh, to include people who aren't part of the mainstream. But as a Liberal, the, the, the issue really with the voice, and here I'll highlight some of the video interviews I've done with people like Tony and yourself and John Howard, and the voice keep, keeps coming up in those discussions, is that fundamentally um, the voice is illiberal in nature because it doesn't provide for equal citizenship for all Australians. Um, and there can be nothing further from the Enlightenment concept of liberalism and conservatism for that matter too, but it's a liberal Enlightenment concept that everybody must be treated equally the same because otherwise there is no dignity of human beings. And when you look at the voice, no matter how you construct it, how you cut it, to me it fundamentally fails that that principle and every Liberal that I've spoken to um, and maybe 90% or more of party members who've discussed this, thing, that come, always comes down to that's it. The practical issues are big enough, they're problems, but the principle at the heart of it fails the Liberal test. Okay, now I think we'll take some questions. Yeah, yeah um, thank you. Um, I think the big elephant in the room, which is getting lost, 
is the education system and particularly for the young kids. I mean, no one seemed to be asking the question, why is it the young generation that's gone off the tracks? I've got my grandchildren and I see some of the homework coming back. A good example, I'm just starting in high school, history, and there was a bust of Captain Cook. Came with a black balaclava. The heading of it was Cook the Crook. Yeah, really, this is high school, right? And, and this is where we lost it. And unfortunately, it looks like it's close to two generations. I think my, my daughters and my grandchildren have come through the system as the university has. And it's a teaching the teachers. And this is where, unfortunately, we come off the rails. And I can't see within the next 10 years you're going to turn that around. You won't. The other bit is, sorry, just to go on, is I got invited along to the ABC to the Q&A. I don't know if anybody here has tried to do that. I had to lie when they asked what party I was actually voting for, <laughs> right? 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 But it was just unbelievable the way the whole thing was branch stacked. And, and, and so anybody watching the ABC and watching nothing else, you know, is, is just going to get one, one story of it. You read the Sydney Morning Herald and the Australian, are they talking about the same, <laughs> same thing? Honestly, you know? But it's the schools. Yeah, and many of the trends you're identifying, uh, I would argue they're actually probably worse in the United States and in Great Britain. But how would you respond to these concerns about education, about James Cook, for example? Mm. Well, I, I agree. Uh, and what we need is a long countermarch to the institutions to correct the errors of the long, the left's long march to the institutions, uh, much of which has happened uh, below, below the radar, only it's now in full, uh, inglorious view. Look, um, I, I think part of our problem is that as people who are broadly of the centre-right, uh, we're too polite. And, see, I bet neither you nor your your uh, children protested to the school about that. Now, I can understand why you wouldn't, because why mark your child out as having fascistic uh, <laughs> parents and grandparents? <laughs> but it's because no one says anything, in part, that this flourishes. And I think that as a general rule, without being impolite, uh, we should be prepared to respectfully but firmly call out error whenever we whenever we see it at least challenge people with a few questions um, and and so all of us I think have got to do more if the world is going to change for the better I mean John Howard's done his bit um, I've done my bit Tom and David are doing their bit um, and yes uh, I guess people like me have failed. Uh, in that sense, but uh, it wasn't for want of trying. Trust me. <laughs> and uh, and look, as 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 Margaret Thatcher said, uh, the facts are conservative. Uh, what is going to persuade people that they shouldn't obsess about emissions is the lights going out. What is going to persuade people that Australia is actually a country worth fighting for is a serious military challenge. Uh, what is going to persuade people? that uh, gender is not infinitely fluid is when a whole lot of people uh, start suing their doctors uh, for acts of mutilation uh, that they now regret. Now, unfortunately, things will get worse before they get better. Uh, and let's hope not too much that is super, super, super harmful happens in that time but they will eventually get better. And, and don't be too pessimistic either, Tony, because uh, you win some, you lose some. I mean, a classic case in point for a victory for both Howard and Abbott was border protection policy. And there's a broad public consensus now, bipartisan consensus in Canberra, generally speaking, that a tough orderly border protection policy helps boost uh, public confidence in our immigration system. And that's something you don't see in Europe right now. Yeah. Next question. Yep, Just on, on education, again, there's a chapter in the book on the issue of education oh, yes. Yes. by John Roskam. And, um, and one of the things that he focuses on, and to Tony's point about the Howard government not being perfect, is actually the national curriculum 
he argues, was a big mistake in setting up a national system because that allowed the left unions and the like to control across the whole country the the, the curriculum that was in place. And unfortunately, uh, we were not able to address that during the, the recent period in office at all, even though Alan Tudge made a fleeting attempt towards the, the last years of the government to try before he was sidelined. And so it's very interesting um, on that question as to how to do it. The Brits have had a go um, under their current government and I think the only solution to your point is, and to Tony's is exactly right, is by diversifying choice in education. So parents have more say in the running of schools. We have more like the UK concept of charter schools. We encourage the setting up of new independent schools. Um, and then we also break down this national curriculum to allow for a diversity of education and curriculum in particular. So at least we can chip away at what is a very entrenched left-wing view of our history. Next question, John Connor. Uh, yes, the Liberal Party now is kind of a skeleton with a skin and no substance. It has, I think, probably in New South Wales, marginally more members than you get at the SCG on a wet Tuesday afternoon to watch a Sheffield Shield match. <laughs> now That many? <laughs> well, it's probably an optimistic position. But having said that, there are cures for this, but it seems to me the party has no appetite for them at all. And, it, the, the, and as a result, its, it's actual structure within the community is not at all strong. For instance, a very simple thing would be to establish viral branches, in other words, on the net. Small business is, can be the core of the Liberal Party. It's not going to go to meetings in drafty church halls. What it will do is do what it does with many other things and go on the net to webinars, meetings and what have you. And you can get variations of that. The concern with the Chinese, for instance, Chinese electorate, in my view, was largely not because of misuse of the word Chinese. It's because the Chinese language media in Australia is governed by the Communist Party of China. And there is no really effective method that's being undertaken by the Liberals or others to meet this. If the Liberals now were to develop a broad community base, which I think is perfectly feasible and can be done quite inexpensively, then I think you've got a sporting chance of achieving a lot of the other things you ought to achieve. Thanks, John. That's a very shrewd observation, John. Now, can I ask, are you a member of the Liberal Party? No, I used to be. And what happened? Because it's became, first of all, it's, right, it's damned hard to join now on a basis which will give you any substance. There are questions asked of you as to put, which are very entirely inappropriate. Very suspicious. Yeah, that's right. The, the insiders that run the joint are very suspicious of and outsiders. Secondly, yeah. you are... The actual means, the actual means of communication and what have you, uh, is archaic. Now that probably troubles me less than it does a lot of other people because of my age. But if I look at younger people, and by younger I mean people in their fifties, it's a real problem. I'm delighted with that definition. <laughs> <laughs> but John, look, you are completely correct, and hopefully, um, the new broom that will inevitably sweep through the New South Wales division, otherwise it will die, uh, will do at least some of the things that you're talking about. Okay, next question. Yes, ma'am. Hi. Um, you've you've touched on um, policies for winning. Um, Sub, um, future elections and moving to the centre-right. Um, I am a branch member and there seem to be ever-widening divisions between centre-right or conservative um, members of the party and those who keep wanting the party to move more to the left. So the broad church is not working um, and I'd like your comment on that. Well, the broad church worked under Howard uh, didn't stop uh, a degree of heresy from people like uh, Petro Giorgio on refugees. Uh, Member for Kuhl. And, uh, and um, Bruce Baird on, on refugees. But the Broad Church um, substantially held under Howard. And I've got to say, in my time, uh, it held in opposition because we were all united to get rid of a bad government. Uh, it only frayed when some people thought, well, actually, I'd like to be Prime Minister, not that ratbag right-winger who is. Um, so, so it's a question. I mean, how do you unite your party? 
uh, the best way to unite your party is to find something that your opponents are doing that you can attack really effectively and your party will rally around you partly out of loyalty, partly out of the desire uh, to fight the good fight because it's a human instinct to want to do that uh, and partly because eventually they'll work out that that's the best way to win. So, so we aren't going to finally resolve through argument the differences between the so-called conservatives and the so-called progressives. We will resolve those differences to the extent that they can be resolved through, if you like, moving beyond them. Uh, take border protection policy. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't win the argument on border protection by persuading people that they were wrong and I was right. I won the argument by demonstrating it because the policy worked um, and that's what we've got to do. Um, argue less theology uh, and more practical improvements. Now, the improvements that turn out to be most effective will be the ones that are sort of liberal conservative as opposed to sort of progressive socialistic, but nevertheless, I think that's the way forward. I agree. Uh, yes, next question. Sorry, I can't see who it is. Yep, sorry. Oh, g'day. Yep. Uh, uh, thank you very much. That was quite fascinating as always. Um, going back to the earlier gentleman's question about education, in the post-war era, during the Cold War, Australia was still a lot more conservative for decades than the rest of the world. Even with all the radical left, there was nowhere near the level of violence that you got in comparable countries from student activism or similar backing. Is there something in the post-war history and what Menzies established or was able to work with that can provide some sort of way forward? Well, I think if we want to make tomorrow better, we should study yesterday. Um, I mean, I think that... Uh, if there's one single problem with the general educational milieu, it's that we don't take anything from the past seriously. I mean, we don't read Shakespeare or Dickens to appreciate them. We read them to critique them. Uh, we don't think wasn't Captain Cook the most extraordinary navigator and wasn't Governor Philip the most extraordinary humanitarian, we think, well, they were pale, stale males, if not actual racist, genocidal monsters. So I just think, you know, that's really where we've got to go. We've, we've just got to go back to a fair-minded uh, appreciation of the good as well as perhaps the bad in all of the things that have shaped us. Now, it's not going to happen overnight, but that's got to be where we go. Yeah. Uh, look, I think that's very true. And I think Australia has not suffered the sorts of division that we've seen in other countries, um, partly because we are more isolated, as in geographically isolated as well. But also Australians are very egalitarian and they're very common sense and very grounded. And, you know, in the book we talk about some of the enduring values of Menzies um, that were there. And... One of the things I think that you find, and maybe we haven't done it enough, is to call out radical leftist agendas. Um, because too often we've just said, oh, that's not important, and we've let it happen, like what's happened to education, um, what's, what's happened with these radical green policies that now leave the country in the, on the verge of having blackouts, for instance. Um, and I think if you look at Australians through history, if they are presented with radical revolutionary proposals from the left, they will go against them. They will. And I think that's why we're seeing issues with the voice, for instance. Once people have had to come to terms with it, they've realised this is not a small change. This is a radical, big change to our constitution. And that's why as people hear that, they start to back away. And I think one of the challenges for liberals is to use the language and to take on the left on a values basis, to call them out on values as much as on policy failures. And then when Australians realise that this is not common sense, what they're talking about, this is radical change they're trying to ram through to re-engineer society, then Australians say, no thanks, we're not into that. Tony, foreign policy... Is there another question? Yeah, sorry. Yep. 
Yeah, Tim Moncton. Um, you've all come up with some interesting thoughts the way forward, but one thing I haven't heard from any of you is leadership. If you want to achieve change, you've got to have leadership. Have we, or have the Liberal Party, both state and federal, got the leadership to be brave enough to do some of the suggestions you have put forward tonight? My answer is, I don't think they have. Well, again, Tim, I probably should ask you the question, are you still a member of the party? I've never been a member of a party. Well, that is perhaps part of the difficulty. We need more good people to join the political party of their choice and try to make it as good as it can be and better than it is. Um, I mean, given that everyone in this room is very interested in public policy uh, and probably a bit of a politics tragic, um, we all of us really should ask ourselves, if we're not a member, why not? Because, frankly, if we want to make a difference, we start by getting on the field, so to speak. If you want to play rugby, you don't stay in the stands. You get out onto the field. So I think that's what we need to be conscious of. Now, now, now Tim, back to your question. Leadership, you're dead right. Uh, it, it, it does all come down to leadership. No leader is perfect. Uh, some are better than others. And I honestly believe that uh, Peter Dutton uh, is by far the best person to lead our party at this time. And I think he has the ability, precisely because he's underestimated, uh, I think he has the ability to really surprise people at, at the next election. But let me also finish on this point. Um, I think it was George Will talking about America in the Carter era, he said, the cry goes up for leadership from millions of people who would not know it if they saw it and would reject it if they did. <laughs> no one's mentioned foreign policy yet. So can I just ask you, you were obviously very favor, uh, supportive of what the Turnbull and the Morrison governments have done and the Albanese government has continued the AUKUS agreement. Since... The Keating Howard era, uh, all Prime Ministers up until recently at least have tried to reconcile relations with our largest trade partner and our most important security ally by riding two horses simultaneously, which is a delicate diplomatic feat. But is there, following on from the criticisms that Paul Keating made at the National Press Club recently, is there a danger um, that we are misjudging this moment given that many states in the region are still trying to be a bit nuanced about the relationship with China and, moreover, given the frighteningly polarised nature of American public discourse, I mean, it's quite conceivable that Donald Trump could become president again, um, and also given that America is overextended in the world, you know, it's battered and bruised after those debacles in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, it's funnelling $70 billion into this Ukraine campaign that may not succeed, is there a danger that um, we're, we're hitching our wagon too closely to the Americans? Well, I'm not going to disagree with you, Tom, in terms of the current polarisation and the uh, dispiriting contrast and choice that, that, that we've got in the United States. And I'm not going to disagree with you that the United States is overextended and that it is in relative decline. I'm not going to disagree with any of those things. But I still think that if we have to choose, and frankly, we uh, can't avoid choice in some ways, we're of course going to choose uh, America over China because we, 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 we would be choosing not America over China, but we would be choosing democracy over dictatorship. And I just think that's an absolutely crystal clear choice. Whatever disappointments we might have with the United States and whatever disagreements we might actually have with certain aspects of American policy. But even you as Prime Minister didn't support freedom of navigation patrols through the South China Sea, which the Americans enthusiastically supported. Well, I, I don't really think that I... I think if, if, you'd, if I'd been there longer, I think you would have seen <laughs> a more robust position. <laughs> I, I, I mean, as Prime Minister, uh, I airdropped... Um, uh, humanitarian supplies to the Yazidis on Mount Sinjar. Uh, I ran guns into the uh, 
uh, the Kurds in Erbil. Um, we got our special forces into Baghdad as quickly as the Americans did. Uh, we got our training team to Taji uh, uh, as quickly as the Americans did. Um, we started bombing Syria as soon as the Americans did. Uh, I, I don't think the Abbott government's military policy was in any way uh, uh, backward leaning. Okay. We've really got to go. I'm so sorry. Ladies and gentlemen, please thank uh, Tony Abbott and David, David Stevens. For decades, CIS has been a fiercely independent voice working hard to promote sound liberal principles. To be notified of our future videos, make sure you subscribe to our channel, then click the notification bell. We rely solely on the generosity of people like you for donations to advance our classical liberal cause. Check out the links on screen now to see how you can get involved. Mm -hmm.